Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Our broadcast today is brought to you by Nature Box. With over a hundred fun, flavorful snacks to choose from, delivered to your doorstep, and your very first box is on them, so you can just taste the goodness for yourself. Use this website. Go to naturebox.com slash thinkingatheist and change the way you snack for the better. naturebox.com slash Thinking Atheist. Sitting on my desk here in the studio, I just got this in the mail yesterday. I was part of the Kickstarter campaign, like I and 200,000 other people were part of this Kickstarter for a game that was being developed by somebody. Some folks, I think, used to work for Xbox, and one of the artists from The Oatmeal was doing a game called Exploding Kittens. And it just the title of the game made me laugh. And so I threw my name on the Kickstarter and threw a few bucks their direction. And for my contribution, I got I got a game. I got Exploding Kittens in the mail. It's a card game. I haven't played it yet. I'm looking at the box here. There's the Exploding Kitten card, which I guess you want to avoid. There are Diffuse cards so that if you receive an Exploding Kitten before you die in a ball of flame, you can diffuse the kitten. And then there are other characters like uh, the... Unicorn Enchilada and Taco Cat. If you open the box, now I'm sitting at the kitchen table last night and I'm opening my mail. Now I open this box where the cards are located and my cat is sitting on the table right next to me, right? He's sitting right next to this box when I open it and it does this. Now, cat freaks. His, uh, the hair stands up all over his body, not just on his back. I mean, the cat just went... (laughs) <laughs> his tail is swooshing around his eyes are wild and he wigged he just wigged out well of course we had to close the box and open it again to see what would happen i mean it took him a half an hour to uh, to recover he searched all over for some rogue feline that had somehow entered his domain i haven't played the game yet um I mentioned something about it on Facebook last night, and I put a picture of the box up. I'm like, look, I got exploding kittens. Well, none other than evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne chimes into the comment section. (laughs) He's like, exploding kittens, that's reprehensible. And we were all laughing about it. We're like, no, 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 not literal exploding kittens. It's a card game. It's just funny. So uh, anyway, I'll play the game probably sometime this week and give you a a review on Facebook and let you know if it's in. Hopefully it'll be fun. It looks doesn't look too hard to figure out. I just enjoy that kind of the art on the cards, the kind of stuff that the oatmeal does. That's that's my kind of humor. It's just really funny. Some edge in there, some sarcasm, uh, really, really good stuff. It's reminiscent of what I'm going to cap the show with uh, today as we talk about the loose screws, some of the crazier apologetics that are flying around out there in the ether. And I have something I'm going to cap the show with, which is something along those lines. It's, it's satirical. It's uh, got a little bit of an edge to it. It's winking at the audience. And I just thought it'd be, it'd be funny. So hang in there for that coming up near the climax of the broadcast tonight. If you are anywhere near Houston, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Austin, or Dallas, the weekend of August 14th through the 16th. I'm doing a series of tour stops down there. In fact, Matt Delahunty is going to join me in Austin since that's his hometown. And Dallas is R. Ra's stomping ground, so he's going to come out and join me for that event on the 16th, which is a Sunday. All the details on those, plus the upcoming Pennsylvania Atheist Humanist Conference September. I've got five dates in North and South Carolina. Free Flow, the Florida Free Thought event, and more, all on the website at thethinkingatheist.com slash events. Hope I get a chance to meet you. On tonight's broadcast, Steve Shives, who has his own sort of uh, irreverent YouTube channel and has done a lot of conversations out there in regard to apologists and apologetics. 
Uh, he's just a funny guy who's got some real insight, and I thought he'd be a great addition to the show, so he's going to sort of function as tonight's unofficial co-host. He's going to join me here in just a second, and Steve and I will be talking with you about some of the more wild, weird, and wacky apologists and apologetics out there. First, a huge thanks out to tonight's show sponsor, Nature Box, changing how people snack for the better. And what's interesting about Nature Box is that everybody sort of has their own thing. They have their own favorites, like I'm partial to the roasted Peruvian corn kernels. Love those things. The Greek yogurt pretzels, freaking delicious. The coffee kettle popcorn. Now, my favorites will change from time to time, as yours probably will as well. And Nature Box is always adding new snacks every single month. There's always something new to check out, something new to try. And what sets them apart is that they essentially bring the grocery store snack aisle to you, right to your front door. Over a hundred options to choose from on a website that's more fun and more convenient than pushing a shopping cart around. Snacks full of flavor with smarter ingredients that are much better than the convenience store overload of sugar, salt, and fat. And if there's ever anything you don't care for, Nature Box will replace it in your next month's box. Right now, your first box of Nature Box snacks is on them. Delicious, hand-picked snacks delivered directly to your doorstep. So act quickly and go to this website. Go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. Unbox the taste. Unbox the possibilities. Naturebox.com slash Thinking Atheist. Steve Shives is a YouTube producer and skeptic. The description box of his channel says atheism, commentary, smartassery of a generally respectable quality. And Steve Shives joins me on the radio. Hey, Steve, how you doing? I'm good, Seth. Thanks for having me on. I saw a series of videos on YouTube. Was it the Bible Reloaded videos where they were doing the Chick Track commentary? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, they do. They do those quite a lot. I've been fortunate enough to uh, guest star on two of them. Uh, those chick tracks or something. <laughs> well, you know, this is a form of apologetics. They're a little bit alarming because they're so simple minded mm. in the way they approach these very complex issues, very serious issues. I saw one just a few weeks ago about suicide. And one kid commits suicide, some demons on his shoulder whispering in his ears. And so he offs himself and then he goes to hell and burns forever. And of course, yeah, there's the cackling of all of Satan's minions as another one bites the dust. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And then there's someone else who's considering suicide and the God squad comes to their rescue. You know, they go with the prayer warriors and they show up at the last minute and and this kind of thing is handed out in comic book form, little comics. Mm -hmm. We used to hand them out when I was a believer and a kid. We used to hand them out in people's Halloween baskets. I'm sure that pissed some kids off seriously. Oh, yeah. Well, and some of them are even Halloween themed. One of the ones that I uh, made fun of with uh, Hugo and Jake on The Bible Reloaded was, I think it was the one called, it was Bewitched. And it was totally a Halloween theme. And it was the, the idea was that Satan had was responsible for all of the occult themed TV shows going all the way back to the sitcom Bewitched. Like that was that was the gateway drug for people. And now that's why we have vampire TV shows and supernatural stuff. And it's all about Satan getting his hands on young people. Those chick tracks are just deranged. I think that's the best word to describe them. They're just utterly deranged. They really do lend themselves to kind of a mystery science theater commentary. Yeah. And it's a brilliant idea to go through them. If the Bible reloaded folks ever wanted somebody to guess shot, I would love to come in and do one of those suckers. That would be just hysterical. <laughs> I was talking to Matt and Aaron about taking the old Thief in the Night movies that had been sort of a staple of my upbringing. They were warnings about the end times. They were supposedly based in the book of Revelation. And I'd like to do like a mystery science theater commentary on those where all the guys just sit around and we just fire up the film and just whatever comes oh. out of our mouths. I just think that'd be hysterical. It seems like great fun. Were they fun to do? Yeah, absolutely. They were great fun to do. And speaking of mystery science theater, I, I actually did something like that on my YouTube channel just recently. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but there's uh, this it's almost like a, a chick tract in cinematic form. This insane evangelical film from the 70s called The Burning hell uh, <laughs> you did you know, a commentary you know the on the burning hell <laughs> yeah i did I, I i i do a gimmick i do a gimmick on my channel where i, I make little i make 
uh, videos starring myself and also starring stuffed animals that I voice and give characters to and myself and two of my stuffed animal characters as a, uh, a milestone for my Patreon campaign. We did a full length commentary on the burning hell. It's one of my favorite videos I've, I've ever done. And it's just like a, a riff tracks or a mystery science theater type of thing. And that thing is nuts. I mean, it's the guy who is responsible for it. Estes Perkle is just, a, he's, he's the perfect embodiment of what this, <laughs> this podcast is about. He is totally a loose screw. I mean, he's, he, he, he really is like a, akin to Jack chick. I, I, I joked in the video that when Estes Perkle uh, opened a chick track for the first time, it must've been like Ed Wood watching citizen Kane. I just had to look it up while you were speaking. Is it Steve and Stuffy Burn in Hell? Is that that's the video? It. Yeah, that's it. Okay, I'm going to make a note to include that link in the description box of this podcast so that it can be easily found. Now, has there ever been anybody anywhere who has had their mind changed by this type of apologetic? I mean, I realize they're playing the fear card. See, with something like the Burning Hell and with something like that brand of fire and brimstone uh, evangelism in general. I, I suspect it's similar to how I think apologetics is, which is they, they make noise about it being pitched at non-believers. But I think the primary audience is people who believe already and just need to be sort of shored up. They need to be re either reassured by the arguments of apologetics that they've got it right and they're okay, they're on the right team, or, uh, you know, sort of scared straight. Because it is difficult to believe <laughs> that anybody would watch something like The Burning Hell or or pick up a chick tract and go, oh, I've got to change my life. But, you know, there's got to be some religious homeschool parent. And I'm talking about religious homeschooling. So everybody just chill. All right. <laughs> but that pod person environment that they are creating, we're going to protect our children from the world. We're not going to socialize them with anyone who has a differing opinion. And we're going to surround them with these types of apologetics. And I can just see somebody showing children this film. Mm -hmm. or a film like it, or religious comic books, these types of things, and no other information, and that becomes their normal, and then they grow up thinking like this, and it's tragic to think about. Yeah, that's why I think so many evangelists and apologists push Christians so hard to instill these values and, and these ideas in their children from a young age and to shield them from the rest of the world. I think uh, one of my... Uh, quote unquote favorite apologists, uh, Josh McDowell has complained repeatedly that the worst thing about being uh, an apologist or a Christian today is that thanks to the internet, the atheists have equal access to our children. Like he really hammers that home. You, you have to protect the children from these atheists because they'll get in there and spoil their minds. Because if you start out on an even playing field, and you don't come to it having already been primed as a child to to just naturally think of these things as normal. Uh, it's it's a very difficult case to make just on facts and evidence because there isn't very much. Steve Shives, don't you think the chick tract and those types of apologetics are really just a form of theological masturbation? I mean, you throw them in somebody's Halloween candy sack or you leave them under the windshield wiper of somebody's car. And you go back to your life and you say, today, I was a minister of the gospel for the most powerful being in the universe. I mean, is this not a sort of an empty form of self-gratification? Oh, absolutely. I think that's exactly right. And I think that's probably by design. If you go to the Chick Track website, it even says, oh, Chick Tracks are they're, they're an easy way to witness to people. And they, they push how effective they are. People read Chick Tracks. If you leave a Chick Track laying in a men's room somewhere, someone's going to pick it up and read it. Here's uh, how to change someone's life for the gospel without having to really do yeah. anything. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say, even though I think it, it can it can be really, really obnoxious and I don't really enjoy it when I'm the, the, the object of it, it does take a certain amount of guts to be the type of person that witnesses to people one on one. I mean, I, I wish people wouldn't do it. I think it's intrusive, but you you know, it's just like speaking in public. You're putting yourself out there. You're putting yourself out there and and you're opening yourself up to the possibility that you will be rejected or you will be shamed or you will be insulted or you will be berated. And with a chick tract, you can avoid all of that 
and you still get the warm, fuzzy feeling inside. You still get to smugly believe that you are doing God's good work when all it's you the really did. the equivalent of I'll pray for you. You know, yeah. I mean, how are you doing? Well, I've got cancer. Oh, I'll pray for you. Bye. <laughs> You're just <laughs> <Yeah>. gone. <laughs> well, as long as you've got it on lockdown, it's all taken yeah. care of. This guy's going to pray for me. Talking here with Steve Shives, I ask you to bring some of your favorite apologists and or apologetics to the conversation because I knew you sort of had a dog in this fight. So give me some highlights. <laughs> well, I found one actually just last night that I, I'm glad that I, I remembered that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, it, he sort of fits into a speech that you gave last year called The Copycats, where you talked about Christian versions of, of non-Christian or secular things. This guy is a fellow YouTuber of ours, and he, I guess you could call him maybe the Christian answer to the atheists who do, uh, as you have done, uh, like animated videos like, and Dark Matter 2525 and non-stamp collector. This is a guy named J.P. Holding who uh, has a YouTube channel called Tekton TV. And most of his videos are really poorly animated attempts to answer, uh, you know, a common atheist arguments. And it's really a sight to behold. It's it's a little bit like Chick Tracks, only it's not quite as nuts as that. It's not quite as deranged. I don't know if anything really is, is as nuts as a Chick Track. Um, but it's interesting because he he depicts himself in the videos usually as a cartoon fox. That's like his avatar and an unusual amount of times in these videos, a, a, a worrisome amount of times in these videos. He depicts himself as the cartoon Fox, physically intimidating and beating up cartoon versions of famous atheists. <laughs> JP Holding, I just put his name into the YouTube search engine. I'm looking at <laughs> the historical reliability of the New Testament on a channel called Exposed Atheists, J.P. Holding Worldview Detective, <laughs> uh, J.P. Holding Demolishes Crazy Pills, uh, Bible Study Stuff. I don't know. I'll have to get into this. J.P. Yeah. Holding, worth searching on YouTube if you've yeah. got some time to kill. <laughs> it's a rabbit hole worth going down. <laughs> he also has a website where he lists a, a supposedly hilarious list of uh, reasons you might be a fundy atheist. He, he loves the term fundy atheist as sort of an answer to fundamentalist Christian. He said, oh, well, you, you have fundy atheists, too. And uh, he has this list that he says is, is modeled after Jeff Foxworthy's You Might be a redneck shtick. Uh, you might be a fundy atheist if, and I, this thing, it, it goes, there's something like 300 items on this list. It just goes on forever. And despite the fact that he describes it as an amusing list, I defy anyone to read this list and find <laughs> me a single joke. There, it's not just that they're bad jokes. There's not a single actual joke on this entire list. If I'm look, if I'm seeing this correctly, it looks like he was on stage with Dr. Richard Carrier on a debate about the reliability of the New Testament. Oh. Now you've got my curiosity. Now yeah, you've I, got Carrier in the mix. That ought to be interesting. <laughs> I have actually not seen that one. If that if that is the case, I have to go watch that. I'm, I'm just that looking at the thumbnail blood here. Blood. Don't take my word for it, folks. Go check it out for yourself. Make sure. But J.P. Holding Richard Carrier, there is a, a debate. Looks like it's in several parts on YouTube. It might be worth checking out. What else you got? Well, even when we, we talk about the more mainstream apologists, you can find elements in their work that sort of peg them as, as loose screws. Uh, one of the attributes that they almost all share is this incredibly grandiose sense of themselves and their own importance and their own talent and abilities. And my favorite example of this is the aforementioned uh, Josh McDowell. I did a a series critiquing his doorstop of a book, evidence that demands a verdict. <laughs> it promises evidence. I didn't find any actual evidence in the entire book. That was one of the, the themes of the series that I did critiquing it was that everything he says is evidence turns out to not actually be evidence. Uh, and as far as the, the grandiosity of the apologist, there's a, a segment, uh, a passage early in the book when Josh is trying to explain how important 
uh, his conversion was and how giving his life to Jesus and becoming an evangelist and an apologist really altered the course of his life. He explains that when he was in college, before he became a Christian, he had mapped out the next 25 years of his life. And his uh, goal at the end of that 25 years was to become the governor of his home state of Michigan. And he describes this as though this was all written in stone, as though this totally would have happened if he hadn't become a Christian. And he explains that he planned to accomplish this goal by uh, using people in order to climb the ladder of success. <laughs> like it was just that simple. And then, but then of course he accepted Christ and saw that it was wrong to use people for selfish ends. And he gave all that up and uh, became an evangelist instead of the uh, future governor of the state of Michigan. So what a guy. Hallelujah. A, yeah, yeah, it's a miracle, right? It's what a, a miracle. It's nice of Josh to make that sacrifice. Steve, have you heard of this guy out of uh, Harlem, this uh, James David Manning guy who's all over the internet? Just barely. I'm not super familiar with him. All but right, he well, he's based in Harlem. Uh, he is founder of the Atlo World Missionary Church in Harlem. He's a rock star of what we would affectionately call LSA or loose screw apologetics is what I'm going to call that. Now, he, <laughs> this guy claims to hold a doctor of philosophy, Ph.D., from Atla Theological Seminary. Now, let's look at that objectively. He essentially gave himself a Ph.D., right? He founded the institution, which is an unaccredited educational, quote unquote, educational institution. And then he gave himself a doctorate. And now he's all over the Web. And he says some extremely inflammatory stuff. In November of last year, he claimed Starbucks was using the semen of sodomites to flavor some of their flavored coffees. <laughs> he said this, and I quote, Starbucks is a place where these types frequent, I guess, homosexuals, <laughs> and a lot of body fluids are exchanged there. But the thing I was not aware of is that there have been information that's been released. What Starbucks was doing is they were taking specimens of male semen and they were putting it in the blends of their lattes. Now, this is <laughs> the absolute truth. In the wake of Pastor Manning's rants about homosexuals, his church sign often brandishing messages like Obama has released the homo demons on the black man. Jesus would stone homos and Harlem is a sodomite free zone. Many human rights activists protested his offensive speech by passing out free Starbucks to pedestrians right in front of his church and good for them. Well, he was back in the headlines just a few days ago, warning heterosexual women about the sodomite demon. This is a soundbite from Manning himself and apparently a warning for the ages. I want to ask you if you have ever been injected with the sodomite demon. Have you ever had that demon injected in you? Now, I tell women, and I preach this all the time in our church. I say, you know, if you have sexual intercourse with a man and he plants his semen inside of you, that semen, whether it makes you pregnant or not, uh, enters into your blood system. It go, your womb is a place for the receptacle and it goes into your blood system. And whatever he has in his blood is in your blood. And for instance, if he has a disease in his blood through his semen, and the, the semen is the cream of the blood, Semen is produced by the blood. It is the cream. It is the it is the power. It is the cream of blood. That's just no other way to say it. It isn't blood itself. It is even more powerful than blood. It can actually produce life semen. But if your blood, if a man puts his semen in you, I teach women. That and if it's disease, you're going to get that disease. You got whatever that is, whether it's AIDS or syphilis or uh, one of these other diseases, you're going to get it because it's going to go right into your blood system, right through your vagina, right through your womb. If a man injects himself in you, if a man injects himself in another man and injects his semen into him and he's crazy, <laughs> he's get his blood as well. Wow. <laughs> and if demons are in him, then those demons, are, you're going to get penetrated by demons. Penetrated by demons. Hallelujah. There's so much wrong with what we just heard, Steve, right? I mean, there's just, 
All right, semen is the cream of the blood. And as he teaches, quote unquote, teaches women, you can be penetrated with crazy <laughs> or, or, or demons or something. You know, he's got a PhD. He, he could really write a hell of a paper uh, about these remarkable properties of semen. The wiki page on this guy says this. Manning has expressed contempt for a range of American political leaders, stating both George W. Bush and his father had anal sex with a hundred men and comparing Barack Obama to Hitler and Satan. In fact, he calls Obama the long legged Mac daddy. And a few years ago on his Manning report, he said this. I, it's just an insult. It's one thing to have a president that you're OK. All right. He's Republican. You're a Democrat. You're a Democrat, he's a Republican, you disagree on policy. But this man is destroying what God loves. He's destroying, he's destroying the fabric and the fiber of the nation. And he's no, he is a prolific, if you will, liar and killer and murderer. Spiritually, politically. I'm telling you, you're going to see an uprising in this nation. Steve, can you get away with that? Can you say that President Obama is a murderer and killer, even if you throw spiritually in on the end of that phrase? Can you get away with it? I apparently yeah, I, it's not something I would want to be quoted as saying uh, in, in public. I, I like how not only he, he says spiritually and politically, it not only sort of softens that charge. So it makes him sound like, oh, I, I'm not really saying that the president of the United States is a prolific murderer. It also basically makes that completely unfalsifiable, because what the hell does it mean to spiritually murder someone? <laughs> I've got Linda on Skype. Linda, thanks for calling the Thinking Atheist radio broadcast. We're talking about the loose screws, some of the more fringe apologetics and apologists out there. What do you have for us today? Well, um, I have a little bit of an anecdote. I, I mean, uh, I see three types of apologetics. So they're the atheists versus the apologists, you know, on the high level existence of God stuff. Then you've got the apologist versus apologist on doctrinal stuff. But then you've also got this segment of like the Dear Abby style of apologetics, where it's the day to day believer that is really sincere and, uh, you know, really wants to apply the Bible to their life, um, literally, and comes to find that, you know, certain promises in the Bible just don't pan out. So uh, one example of that is James chapter five for anyone who has a, uh, you know, prolonged illness, uh, something that they're been praying for a really long time for, and they'll see this promise that you go to the elders, you get anointed with oil and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And, uh, you know, if any sins have been committed, they'll be forgiven and that person will be made well. And uh, we know that that doesn't work. You know, the MS doesn't go away. The diabetes doesn't go away. So that leaves a, a believer with, with a, a crisis of faith. So you go to your pastor or you go to the apologist website and you want to get these answers, uh, questions answered. So unfortunately, trying to defend a verse like this, which clearly black and white is a promise that is supposed to be unfailing and infallible, the apologist has to come up with a reason, a rationale why, uh, why that doesn't work for some people or why it doesn't work at all. And unfortunately, sites like CARM, uh, Matt Slick's site, and some others like gotquestions.org, they do have uh, teaching and a worldview belief about demonic activity in people's lives. So oftentimes, these really tough verses get bounced back with, um, well, you know, it's Satan, um, demonic activity that you've opened the door for. So the person who's suffering is now uh, loaded up with the responsibility of, you know, maybe you went to an acupuncturist or maybe you opened yourself up by watching a certain television show or listening to, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin, something like that. And it, it, this type of worldview is really damaging because it makes people um, spiritualize normal things, normal things about life, and then, you know, judge themselves and others uh, and, and have to look sometimes even back through the generations. I mean, I was told that, my uh, thing that I was dealing with was um, possibly something that a, an ancestor did. I don't know what they did to tick off God, you know, generations ago. How am I supposed to find that? But it really is not a rational point of view, and it really uh, is not living in reality. 
Now, you referenced CARM. For those who aren't familiar with Matt Slick and CARM, Matt Slick is the president of the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry. It was founded back in 1995. It's a nonprofit. They've got apparently a few dozen contributors. And I was sort of browsing one of the pages on CARM, and it was talking about uh, demons, demons at war against God, the minions of Satan, and Quite often, demons are blamed for many of the maladies that confront us in our life. If you aren't being cured of cancer, if it's not disobedience, maybe you're just being infected with demons. That kind of thing is pretty prevalent. Yeah, I mean, this is this is where it's, I mean, Matt Slick, in his defense, he's not as extreme as some of the deliverance ministries are and some of the, you know, healing of televangelists and stuff like that. But uh you know, it, it really, that idea is a seed that's planted in people's minds and, you know, trickling down into the congregations that individuals can get some really, really unhealthy ideas about illness. And when, when you start putting that yoke on people's shoulders that they're responsible for their illness or they need to be paranoid about something, that doesn't facilitate a body to heal. You know, that creates mental stress, which will not help you to heal. And it's self-reinforcing. I mean, it's, it's just really unfortunate. Steve, you've heard some of this kind of talk, haven't you? I mean, I'm looking at the CARM website, right? Part of your problem may be occult activity. Maybe you believe a false religion, drug use, porn. You may have been cursed by someone else. Quote, sometimes people involved in occult activity will curse you or your family. Well, you know, if you're trying to get a shaman in the door to remove the curse, you're not seeking science-based solutions to whatever your problem is. No, there is a, it's a common thread among many apologists that if you do have a problem or you do run into a, a, a difficult to reconcile Bible verse, like Linda was talking about, it's either your fault or the devil's fault. And in most cases, it's it's some combination of the two. Um, but what, what I found interesting is no matter how highbrow the apologist, no matter how intellectual and, and scholarly they they try to make themselves appear with their approach, they they all ultimately come back to, oh, and by the way, there's demons. You know, it, it, they, they try to make it sound very sort of almost almost completely reasonable. Hey, we're just talking about philosophical arguments. There's a God and there's an afterlife. And if there's if there's the finite, then there must be the infinite and all this very, you know, dense philosophical sounding language. But eventually they all end up talking about the eternal war between God and Satan, like any other preacher frothing at the mouth on a street corner. Linda, thanks so much for being a part of the broadcast. Thanks for uh, calling in. Oh, thanks so much. Steve, you got anybody else you've brought to the table for the broadcast tonight? Well, it's it's more it's not so much a person. It's a trope that I find repeatedly in apologetics. I've uh, for whatever reason, masochism, probably I've reviewed uh, 13 apologetics books uh, on my YouTube channel. And there's a. Uh, an experience that is shared by a huge number of these apologists, almost half of them that I have read share the experience of having encountered just while they're out in public or waiting for a bus or sitting on an airplane, encountering an atheist philosophy professor. This happens so often. There must be the, the population of the United States must be about 75 percent atheist <laughs> philosophy professors for for all of these people to have just. Oh, hey, hi. Nice to meet you. I'm an atheist philosophy professor. And it's uh, Ray Comfort talks about it. Norman Geisler talks about it. Uh, Josh McDowell talks about it. And in two of the books I reviewed this year. Both of them, two in a row, the God's Not Dead by Rice Brooks and the Magic Man in the Sky by Carl Gallops. They both describe these encounters with uh, philosophy professors. And, of course, they get into arguments with them and they completely shatter their uh, atheist delusions. And the atheist philosophy professors are always forced to admit that, well, the Christian kind of has a point. And it, it's stunning how frequently this these are and it's also amazing that these are all apparently very uh, prominent people because they're never named but they're always described as a philosophy professor at a prestigious ivy league university is this a variation on like the einstein thing where uh somebody in the class holds up their hand and asks the professor a, a salient question 
And uh, at the end, he proves that God can or must exist. And then it, it is revealed that the student was Einstein. Have you seen that thing floating around? The oh, way? yeah. Yeah. It's it's sort of like that. It's it's a little bit like there's that there, the all of those scenes in the movie. God's not dead for all of you who have who are unfortunate enough to have watched that film. Uh, you know, there's the, the conflict between the atheist philosophy professor played by Kevin Sorbo and the student, the Christian student who is sort of at odds with him and they have this series of exchanges in the classroom over the existence of God. It's it's sort of like the apologists are saying that, oh, that happened to me. It's like they were I'm sure they were all sitting in the movie theater watching that movie going, oh, that totally happened to me. <laughs> Steve Shives uh, joining me for the broadcast tonight, sort of the unofficial co-host. You brought up Norman Geisler. It's so funny. I One of the first videos I ever produced for the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel was called The Story of Susie. This was back in 2009. Mm-hmm. Two years later, the Christian Post picked it up and did a story on it. It was written by Catherine Fan. And it was uh, under the headline, Atheist Depicts Christians as Delusional in Story of Susie Video. Now, the interesting part about this particular article is they were able to get a hold of Geisler, the apologist, for like a 19-paragraph article, but somehow were not able to get in touch with me, the guy who merely produced the video that they <laughs> happened to be commenting on, right? And Susie, if you haven't seen the video, you can find anybody can find it anywhere online, but Essentially, it reveals the sort of the nonsensical nature of thanking God, praying to God, giving God all the credit while the world is spinning around you in, in often chaotic ways. And Susie, this wide-eyed believer, just says, thank you, Jesus, as the plane crashes and a fiery plume above her head kind of a thing, you know. Yeah. So they talked to Geisler and he said this. He said, the video contains a lot of misconceptions. Quote, you look at all of that and you sympathize with Susie because you think they, disasters, illnesses, etc., are evil. But if it's evil, then there must be a standard of good. If there's a crooked line in this world, then there must be a straight line. If there is a straight line, then there must be God. <laughs> now, it's been four years plus since this came out. And I still have no idea what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, neither do I. That's another sort of common apologist tactic is they, they make these arguments as though the principles that they're describing follow logically when they don't at all. That doesn't it doesn't follow at all to say, well, if there's if there's a, a crooked line, then there must be a straight line. And if there's a straight line, there must be God. That makes no sense at all. That's complete gibberish. How does it, how does a straight line necessarily imply God? And let's say there is the absolute standard, you know, and we'll get to side 10 Bruggenkate here in just a second. But, mm. you know, it, let's say there is one. How do you attribute that to a specific deity with a proper name? It's not just something out there set the standard in place, created the standard. They then take this huge leap where they find a specific deity, a specific character as part of a specific religion presented in a, in a specific holy book out of the thousands of options to choose from. And nobody ever stops and says, well, why this guy? Well, I was at the debate that Matt Dillahunty did with Cy Tim Bruggenkate in Memphis, Tennessee. Was it last year or the year before? I can't remember. It's all kind of a blur. But they did a debate on the subject of, is it reasonable to believe that God exists? And this is a soundbite from Cy Ten Bruggenkate on his defense of why it is reasonable to believe in God. Why is it reasonable to believe that God exists? Quite simply, because it's true that he exists. Here's my argument. Premise one, it's reasonable to believe that which is true. Premise two, it's true that God exists. Conclusion. Therefore, it's reasonable to believe that God exists. You can hear the audience kind of going, oh boy, it's going to be a long night, right? Yeah. It's reasonable to believe that which is true. It is true that God exists. Therefore, it is reasonable to believe that God exists. Well, somebody in the audience said, why Yahweh or Jesus? Why not some other God? Why this specific deity? And this was Sai's answer. Well, the thing is, that defense is available. And I'll be happy to discuss anybody who claims that Zeus is their god. Or who, who claims that the, uh, the uh, flying spaghetti monster, as you have on your shirts out here, if they want to claim that, I'll be happy to debate them. If people want to say that 
believing in God is necessary precondition for truth, I'll be happy to debate them. But the thing is, that's not what he's saying tonight. I'll be happy to debate anybody who has any other claim as a necessary foundation for truth. I'll be happy to debate anybody. I'm saying that no other gods exist because that's what the Bible says. All the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. See, I'm, people say sometimes, you know, you're atheistic towards all those other gods. No, I'm not. There are no other gods. I'm not an idolater. What did he just say, Steve? It makes no sense. It's, I'm, it, he, Psy and that whole presuppositional uh, approach to apologetics is a great example of why it really doesn't matter if you have a logically valid argument if you have no evidence to back it up. You can construct a logically valid argument for the existence of anything, and it's not persuasive. You can't just say, well, it's logical to believe that God exists because God exists. You haven't proven anything. You've just made a claim and you've stated it in a logical form. And yeah, I, I really, I don't understand what Sai is saying most of the time. I've, I've, <laughs> I, I've, I actually, I was in a hangout with him about two years ago and it was literally like he was just a human version of his website. He has the, his proof that God exists website where you, you take that little step-by-step -step, choose your own adventure test yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he it's that's exactly what it's like having a conversation with him because he just he goes into his pitch and that's it and if you if you bring up other things he just sort of pushes them to the side and says well uh, i i won't have a bible study with a non-believer you know he or, said that in memphis i won't yeah. do a bible study. and i thought well how in the world are you supposed to convince the masses if you won't help to explain and like as if God needs Cy Tim Bruggenke to explain his perfect message, which is another flaw in the argument. But if you won't do yeah. a Bible study for proper understanding of the scriptures, how are people supposed to come to a point of acceptance of the scriptures? And then he made the statement that everybody in the audience believed in God. He said, I, you all believe in Jesus. Essentially, you're just denying him or you're in rebellion or it's ego or something else. I don't know. But the declaration that all of the non-believers in the audience were believers and Sai somehow knew all of this is a little bit disturbing. Well, he, he believes that because that's what the Bible says. And the Bible says uh, everyone has a belief in God or everyone has some, some level of knowledge of God. And those who say they don't believe in God are just suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And that again is is a foundational belief of presuppositional apologetics. The the book that I'm reviewing now actually, I'm just about to finish it. I'm going to do my last episode this week, uh, my Atheist Read series on the defense of the faith by Cornelius Van Til, who is like the the godfather of the presuppositional apologetic. And his approach is is just as absolutist as uh, as size is. He 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 makes no attempt to find any common ground with anybody. Uh, he actually preaches relentlessly against apologetics methods that seek to find common ground with non-believers. He says, no, you can't have any common ground with non-believers. You have to tell them that their worldview is completely wrong and your worldview is completely right. And your worldview is the only one that makes any sense. And when he acknowledges that this might not be very persuasive to people, uh, he says, well, that's okay because it's up to the Holy Spirit whether they're convinced or not anyway. So it's almost a more academic sounding version of that flattery and that conceit that we were talking about earlier with the chick tracks. Van Til and, and to, a, a, to an extent, I think, Psy, they both feel the same way about it. That it's not up, they don't need to worry about whether or not their case is persuasive to people because it's really ultimately up to God whether they accept it or not. It's just his job to put it in front of you. And many believe it's predestined. I think I, I can't recall yeah. the scripture right off the top of my head, but it's something about how that, uh, you know, it, it's sort of already been predetermined as to whether or not you're going to accept or not accept, which makes the, the whole idea of evangelicalism even more crazy. Why in the world are you evangelizing the world if it's already set in stone? Have you seen that uh, circular poster? I know there's one on the Rational Wiki website, but it says the Bible is the word of God. And then it says, but how can you be so sure it's the word of God? Because the Bible tells us so. But why believe the Bible? The Bible's infallible. How do you know it's infallible? And it goes right back to the beginning. The Bible is the word of God. And you get caught in this feedback loop where you never actually step out and look at the Bible objectively. Hell, whenever my father and I are talking about religious issues and the validity of Scripture, he continues to quote the Bible to prove 
the Bible. It's like that meme out there with the Spider-Man comic, right? And it says, yeah. this is proof that Spider-Man exists. <laughs> exactly. Know? I mean, it's it's such an insular way of looking at it. And yet people get locked in this prison and they just can't get out. And that's the thing about that particular brand of apologetic, that presuppositional method is if you are inside that circle, it seems impenetrable. It seems like you can't lose. You've got the absolute truth. You have 100% metaphysical certainty that you are right. But if you are looking at it from outside that circle, it's blatantly false. You you don't even have to think too long about it before you can figure out, wait, that can't possibly be right. That makes no sense at all. That's just a completely circular argument. And it's based on premises that you just sort of assume for no reason. If you assume that the Bible is an unquestionable authority, then sure, that makes perfect sense. But why would you ever assume that? Cameron sent me a message about a Dr. Thomas Kendall. Dr. Kendall explains how the earth could only be 6,000 years old. He references a book, Starlight and Time, by Dr. Russell Humphreys, their award-winning physicist. He talks about how time is different at sea level, and on top of a mountain, time runs differently. So at the beginning of the universe, earth is basically at the center of the universe and when six days would pass here, billions of years pass at the edge of the universe. This happened at the early part of our history, but not now. It somehow explains why we can see all the stars in the sky. Now, Dr. Kindle has received advanced training, according to his own website, in scientific creationism through the Graduate School of the Institute for Creation Research. Aha! <laughs> it was just a matter of time, wasn't it, Steve? <laughs> yeah. At least he didn't give himself the PhD. He's been privileged to study under several of the world's most prominent creationist scientists. He's also studied Christian apologetics and biblical scientific creationism at California Graduate School of Theology. A lot of religious universities going on. Well, I hadn't really heard much about Dr. Thomas Kendall, so I did some digging, and I found his commentary about why we can see the starlight and still hold to the young earth. And so the Bible clearly teaches a sixth literal day creation about 6,000 years ago. The evolutionists object immediately and say, no, that's not physically possible, it's unscientific, because we can see stars and galaxies that are billions of light years away, and light, even at the incredible speed of about 186,000 miles per second, would take billions of years to traverse those huge distances. Therefore, the fact that we can see the light shows it must have been traveling for that long. And if it traveled that long, the universe is billions of years old, not thousands of years old. And the Earth must have been here for billions of years. Now, the problem with that argument is that it's caged in seemingly a scientific argumentation, but it really isn't. It's a philosophical argumentation because science is limited and it cannot test the past. It cannot prove what happened in the past. Science cannot prove that there is no God. You'd have to have universal knowledge, omniscience, to prove there is no God. Thus, you'd have the attributes of God. Thus, you would be God. Thus, if you could prove there was no God, you'd be God. God would therefore exist. It would be a self-refuting logical argument, as we looked at last night. So, they can't prove God doesn't exist. It could be. And science can't pass judgment on whether this is true or not because it's limited. It can't test everything and it can't test the past. Because of this, it could be that there is a God and he is the God of the Bible. And if so, the stars don't exist by chance. They were put there on purpose. And God had a sovereign purpose in them being there for days and seasons, times and years. And God had a purpose in them being there to declare his glory, Psalm 19.1. If we couldn't see them, they wouldn't declare his glory. So if God had a sovereign purpose in creating the universe for us to see the stars, could he do it? Yes, if he exists. For one thing, he doesn't have to follow the laws of chemistry and physics. He made them, they didn't make him. They stand at attention and say, yes, sir, whenever he tells them what to do. Like when he wants to walk on water, or he wants to multiply the loaves and fishes, or he wants to raise the dead. You'll find that violates physical laws. First law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics, law of gravity. But when you own the universe, you can do what you want with it. And if there is a God, he could create the universe in such a way that even with the young Earth, we could see the stars billions of light years away. One thing being, speed of light could have been faster in the past. All we can test is what the speed is today. Okay, now I don't know, <laughs> what time is it? Because I need a drink after the two minutes of that. Because I'm I, I, right at the beginning, he makes the statement that science can't disprove God, which is a total straw man. I'm an atheist. I don't say 
I've disproven God. Right, I right. say I don't believe in a God or the supernatural based on the evidence. I haven't seen any evidence for it. But the creationists love this. Atheists say there is no God, period. We might say there is no benevolent God. We might say we can disprove specific gods with proper names posited in certain religious holy books and doctrines and dogmas and whatnot because they have specific properties we can examine and test. But the idea of this nebulous deistic God out there floating some uh, way out in, in the outer membrane of the cosmos beyond space and time, blah, blah, blah. We can't disprove Russell's teapot, right? right that right. kind of thing. But the yeah, other thing yeah. is, is it could be true. Therefore, it is true. Seems like an awfully big leap. Did you catch that? I have actually heard attempts to make scientific arguments about why we can see stars that are further than, you know, six to 10,000 light years away if the universe is only supposed to be that old. And he really doesn't even attempt to make one of those arguments. He just goes straight to, well, you can't disprove God. And if God wanted to make the universe in such a way that we could see those stars, then that's what he did. He doesn't like, <laughs> okay. He, he goes straight to, well, if you own the universe, you can do what you want with it. Okay. Well, Tossing okay. the thermodynamics argument, by the way, that's a classic. Somebody throws out usually the second law of thermodynamics. The next question is, well, tell me what the other three are. Exactly. Uh, and they're like, I got, 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 you know, and, and then we get into the whole open system, closed system, chaos, entropy, all those types of things. But these sound very scientific and to the uninitiated, perhaps very impressive. Those people sitting in the pews listening to this guy, especially at the sheer speed that this man is traveling through his material, they're probably a bit overwhelmed by his acumen. Oh, yeah. He's he's going at quite a a, a quick gish gallop there. <laughs> yeah. um, he, But, you know, what's, it, it all comes back to geocentrism, doesn't it? I mean, it all comes back to some struggle to, to rehabilitate this concept of geocentrism that was discarded scientifically hundreds of years ago. We know from observation of the universe that the world does not revolve around us, that the earth is not at the center of it, that the sun is not at the center of it, that we occupy a completely ordinary position in a vast universe that we make almost no difference in. We're just a part of this vastness. And yet apologists like that guy uh, are just desperate to, to bring some sort of geocentrism or anthropocentrism back into the forefront. It has to be all about us somehow. Maybe it's that the earth is at the center of the universe and the further up and the further out you go, time moves differently. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> Never mind that we know we're not the center of the universe. Now, the question is, would you rather spend an hour and a half listening to this man or would you rather spend some time listening to my next apologist? This was suggested by our listener, Andrew, who said you need to check out Pastor Kearney Thomas otherwise known as the screaming pastor. I mean, you're going to hell right now and you're needing God to work the miracle for you. The God will not only hear, but God will answer my prayers. The prayer of faith for you, for God. But come on, is this real? I mean, is this guy for real or what? <laughs> Why do they call him the screaming pastor? <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> Kearney, K-E-R-N-E-Y, Thomas. I won't subject you to any more of it, but if you're curious, I'm sure there's plenty more wow. on YouTube. It's an interesting tactic uh, to just get the person you're debating to go, you know what the hell with this? You win. <laughs> and just walk away. <laughs> to make your opponent die a little inside. Yeah. It's always a great debate tactic. Uh, uh, this was sent in by Ryan regarding presidential candidate Donald Trump. This was written in charismamag.com by a guy named Jeremiah Johnson. Love that movie, by the way. Jeremiah Johnson's on the eldership team of Father Ministry in Lakeland, Florida. He's listed on Charisma Mag's website as a, quote, gifted teacher, not just a teacher. He's a gifted teacher, book author, and prophetic minister. This is dated July 28th of this year, quote, I was in a time of prayer several weeks ago when God began to speak to me concerning the destiny of Donald Trump in America. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Trump shall become my trumpet to the American people, for he possesses qualities 
that are even hard to find in my people these days. Trump does not fear man, nor will he allow deception and lies to go unnoticed. I'm going to use him to expose darkness and perversion in America like never before. Hang on just a second. Donald Trump is our moral barometer. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But you must understand that he is like a bull in a china closet. Many will want to throw him away because he will disturb their sense of peace and tranquility. But you must listen through the bantering to discover the truth that I will speak through him. I will use the wealth I have given him to expose and launch investigations searching for the truth. Just as I raised up Cyrus to fulfill my purposes and plans, so have I raised up Trump to fulfill my purposes. And this is a post site and plans <laughs> prior to the 2016 election. You must listen to the trumpet very closely, for he will sound the alarm and many will be blessed because of his compassion and mercy. Though many see the outward pride and arrogance, I've given him the tender heart of a father that wants to lend a helping hand to the poor and the needy, to the foreigner and the stranger. Here at the very end, I'm already stuck on, does he seem like a, a guy who's totally focused on the poor and the needy mm. with all of the sort of the gaudy toys and the flash and the bling all in his life? You think about all the hungry mouths that those might have fed. I'm not saying he's never given to charity or doesn't give to charity, but I'm saying this, when you look at him, is philanthropy the first word that comes to your mind? And after a statement about a Mexico, <laughs> yeah, his compassion and helping hand to the foreigner doesn't exactly ring true either, does it? No, but I guess if you ask Donald Trump, I'm sure he would say that the poor people love him because everybody loves him. If you ask <laughs> Donald Trump, I think it, it, it's I, I noticed that toward the end of that quote, the the, the author said that uh, God has given Trump the tender heart of a father. And the first thing I thought of was that Trump quote where he was talking about his own daughter and how she's so attractive that if she wasn't his daughter, he would probably go out with her. Oh my God. The tender heart of a father. Steve Shives joining me for the broadcast tonight as we talk about the loose screws, the crazy apologetics out there. You got anything else for us tonight, Steve? I've got one more that I think might fit the bill. It's something that I guess you can't really talk about loose screw apologists without at least mentioning Ray Comfort's name. Uh, this is not the banana story. Everybody knows the banana story, uh, which is actually related by him proudly in his book. In addition to uh, the video he made, he just he was so in love with that banana story. It's kind of uh tragic to see how it's been it's brought him to such infamy because he really thought that was some really good stuff um, now, now for those who let's say for the one person in a hundred thousand who hasn't heard the banana story just synopsize it real fast would you it, it's basically ray using the modern banana as an example of god's perfect design and how he he created nature with man in mind and look the banana fits in your hand just perfectly and it, it changes color to tell you when it's good to eat and it has a little tab at the front that you know you can peel it with it's and the the, the problem with that is that the modern banana like virtually all fruit that is eaten by people today is the result of hundreds of years of cultivation and the the wild banana is virtually inedible the the banana that god supposedly made is something that nobody would want to eat today and most people would not even recognize as a banana the banana that ray is holding is the result of human intelligent design there's a great meme out there in the internet and it shows ray comfort holding the banana and it says something along the lines of the banana it fits perfectly in your hand it also fits perfectly in your ass. <laughs> I exactly. just thought it was hysterical. <laughs> exactly. But I want everyone to know, lest they think otherwise, that there is more to Ray than the banana story or hanging out with Kirk Cameron. Yeah. Uh, he has written several books, and I, I, I reviewed some of his books in uh, an Atheist Read series I did about Ray Comfort. And in his book, God Doesn't Believe in Atheists, he describes this stunt that he pulled uh, some years ago when he was doing street preaching in Honolulu. And he says he was having a hard time drawing a crowd to listen to his street preaching. Imagine that. And uh, so he decides to to stage a funeral drama where he dresses up as a priest 
And he has some of his his fellow apologists or evangelists or whatever, other people on his team, uh, throw together a mock funeral where one of them is shrouded like a corpse and the others are carrying the corpse through the streets. And, and Ray is is leading the procession as a priest. He's doing this this little skit to try and get attention and, and draw a crowd for his preaching. And as he's performing this skit, a rumor starts to spread through the other people on the street that someone has actually drowned at a nearby beach. And Ray throws in a token line about how, well, he wanted to stop the funeral drama because he felt that it was in bad taste, but he didn't have time because, you know, the crowd started to gather. What, what, what happened was the people who had heard that there was a drowning at the beach thought that the fake funeral that Ray was performing with the the fake corpse was the actual person who had drowned. Wow. So a crowd gathered. And despite acknowledging that this would have been in bad taste to do, Ray, by his own testimony, that says that he did what any good evangelist would do and capitalized on the situation and preached to the crowd of people who had gathered thinking that that fake corpse was the drowned person. Now, it turns out that there was no drowning at the beach that day. It was all just misunderstanding. But uh, Ray doesn't really make it clear if he knew that at the time or if that would have made any difference at all. The question becomes, are you that desperate for attention, right? Yeah. I mean, let a, God doesn't shine a spotlight down on the heavens so that you can preach the good news. No, you have to go out and gimmick your way into the headlines. It just seems a little bit forced to me. And it's it's an example and that uh, Donald Trump story was another example of how how far God's standards have fallen since <laughs> since the time of the Bible. When you read in the New Testament about and it makes it, it makes Jesus and, and the disciples, even though the disciples are sometimes described as sort of idiots because they have to be dumb. So Jesus can teach them things. But they're still described as all oh, these great, brave heroes. And they traveled all over the Middle East. And and so we've gone from from those people, those, you know, if you're a Christian, these giant historical figures who are bravely spreading the word to guys like Ray comfort and God is calling someone like Donald Trump to be yeah. his modern day Cyrus. Like it's, it's bad enough that the miracles have gone from resurrections and walking on water and calming storms and, and feeding thousands of people to, you know, Jesus appearing in somebody's pancakes. As reported just a few days ago in the raw story, the Hadron Collider is apparently the Tower of Babel, according to a, quote, Christian investigative journalist named Zach Drew, who works for evangelist Jim Baker. Yeah, Jim Baker, who was convicted of a felony for fraud and conspiracy back in 1989 in relation to his multi-million dollar ministry scam, where he sold lifetime vacations to people for thousands of dollars and then didn't and or couldn't deliver. And he did prison time. He's now back on the air as an evangelist. Well, the article posted just a few days ago, Zach Drew, this investigative journalist, a believer, warned that science is tempting God to destroy us all, as he did with the Tower of Babel, by searching for the God particle using the Large Hadron Collider. Quote, what have I told you again today? The ancient story of the Tower of Babel is being repeated. Isn't it interesting that people from all around the world have once again come together to build the largest machine that man has ever constructed? They say it's for the purpose of discovering the God particle, this mystery particle that essentially holds the entire universe together and, if found, would explain our very existence. The Large Hadron Collider, the Tower of Babel, the whole world came together to work on it. The people at the Tower of Babel's goal was also to reach a portal or gateway into the sky or into another dimension where God dwells. Is this all mere coincidence? Well, first of all, his reasoning is flawed because the Tower of Babel didn't destroy humankind. Science is tempting God to destroy us all like he did with the Tower of Babel. Well, if, even if you buy the Tower of Babel story, it didn't destroy anybody. He just gave them all different dialects, different languages. He had them all speak in ways that were nonsensical to everybody else, and they all splintered and scattered, but nobody was destroyed. I mean, the guy's not even quoting the Bible correctly. Go figure. Another problem with that is if God does mean to destroy us 
for building this new metaphorical Tower of Babel. He's dragging his feet a little because they found the Higgs boson with that thing like two years ago. <laughs> I mean, it's been it's been confirmed and reconfirmed, but the actual finding, it's been two years. I remember I was really excited about it. I So I guess God is still drawing up his plan. So how am I going to get these guys? I will admit to sort of going to the bottom of the well on this next one are you familiar with the youtuber nephilim free oh Steve? yes Steve Shives. well i don't even know if he's active anymore does he still produce content i don't um, know if he does he i think he's kind of uh semi-retired i haven't seen i mean i i never paid a super large amount of attention to him in most any way, people but, didn't i'll admit it all right i admit yeah. it it's a cheap shot i admit it's it's a little bit too easy but but his claim regarding the origin of moon craters was so ripe that I had to harvest it for use on this broadcast. This is YouTuber and apologist, I guess. Nephilim Free. This was posted back in 2011 as he explains why there are craters on the moon and how it is actually related to Noah's flood. Recently, I made a video discussing the evidences of the Noachian flood, some of the evidences, a few of them. And uh, in that video, I explained that the Earth split open at the mid-Atlantic ridges, uh, which run around the Earth like a, the seam of a baseball, and the great pressure of the crust of the Earth, six miles of it, on, on this water caused the water to eject from the earth at supersonic speed. Much of this water escaped the escape velocity of the earth and headed toward the moon where the moon's gravity accelerated it and the moon was pelted by water frozen from the uh, frozen water which came from inside the earth at the beginning of the Noachian flood. So moon craters exist <laughs> because <laughs> water from Noah's flood was ejected off of the surface of the earth propelled toward the moon where they impacted. And the fact that there are moon craters actually proves the great flood of Genesis. I don't think I have any further commentary, Steve. I don't know. Do you, do you have anything? <laughs> makes, <laughs> makes sense to me, Seth. I don't know what your problem is. Um, the only thing I can think of with that is, well, wh then why are there so many craters on the far side of the moon that always faces away from the earth? If the craters are from frozen you know, no flood ice flying out into space and hitting the moon. Do you follow any of Pat Robertson stuff, Steve? Uh, yeah, yeah. I he's he's great when I need an extra item for my one of my five stupid things videos. <laughs> <laughs> CNN is compiled. By the way, uh, Pat Robertson is a former Southern Baptist minister. He's the current chancellor and CEO of Regent University, a religious university, and chairman of CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. He's written a shit ton of books, and he's host of the religious television show, The 700 Club. Well, CNN compiled a top 10 of his craziest quotes. Uh, just a few gems from this article back in October of 2013. A viewer of the 700 Club wanted to know how to address images of same-sex couples when they showed up in their Twitter and Facebook feeds. Robertson said instead of punching the like button, if it gave him the option, he would click vomit. He said adultery is essentially the wife's fault. Quote, males have a tendency to wander a little bit. And what you want to do is make a home so wonderful he doesn't want to wander. Aha. Hmm. You didn't make a proper home. You didn't take care of your man. Of course, he's going to go sleep around. He said Disney World's gay days will bring upon us the divine punishment of earthquakes, tornadoes, possibly a meteor, and of course, terrorism. He said this about feminism, quote, the feminist agenda is not about equal rights for women. It's about a socialist, anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. And he has said the charge of many of Adolf Hitler's associates were Satanist and homosexuals because, well, you know, the two apparently seem to go together in Pat Robertson's mind. The more he speaks, the more we win, Steve. The yeah. more this man opens his mouth, the more we win. Here's just a clip from 2009. We haven't taken this to its ultimate conclusion. You got polygamy out there. How can we rule that polygamy is illegal when you say that homosexual marriage is legal? 
What, what is it about polygamy that's different? Well, polygamy was outlawed because it was considered immoral according to biblical standards. But if we take biblical standards away in homosexuality, well, what about the other? And what about bestiality? And ultimately, what about uh, uh, child molestation and pedophilia? How can, how can we criminalize these things at the same time uh, have constitutional amendments uh, allowing uh, same-sex marriage among homosexuals. This man is terrifying, Steve. He's terrifying <laughs> to me. And what's this, what is up with this immediate leap from non-heterosexuality to bestiality? Everybody you, seems to want to take that jump. We all have an uncle like that, don't we? We all, <laughs> we all have the guy who you, you only see them at Thanksgiving and you, you're like, oh, we have to invite him. We're his only family. But yeah, it, I've never understood that either. I, and it doesn't really, it's not really borne out by history. The United States is actually, I think we're, we are now the 16th major nation to legalize same-sex marriage on a national level. So 15 countries did it before us. I haven't heard about a rash of bestiality <laughs> in any of those countries. <laughs> it's it's common language. Right? Well, what's next? You know, sex with animals. You're going to go out and marry a hyena. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that's right, because a hyena can give consent and sign a legal marriage contract. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's no... There is no bestiality lobby. Same-sex marriage was legalized as a result of decades of, of political activism. There is no political activism to legalize bestiality. There, that's the main reason why it's never going to happen. Pat Robertson can rest easy because nobody even wants it. Nobody even really thinks about it except for people like him, apparently. I'm amazed at how often these warnings about the end time revolve around non-heterosexuals. There's a guy named Rick Wiles who is uh, part of a website called True News, T-R-U, True News. And he warns America and the world about what he calls the gay stopo. Check this out. The German churches that were intimidated by the Nazis had swastikas flying above their churches. So what you'll have in the United States are cowardly, wimpy churches that will have a rainbow flag. There's no difference. Yeah. Rainbow flag, Nazi swastika. It's the same thing. It's the same spirit behind it. Yet again, we have to see them throw the Hitler grenade into a conversation about human rights. It's funny. I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, a few months ago, and I, I was walking down the street, and I passed a really huge, beautiful old stone church, and it had a rainbow banner over the top of it, over across the front entrance. And it, it had a message about, you know, we welcome all people or something like that, a very inclusive, like pro LGBT message. And I mean, I guess now I know those are just Nazis. If the world's going to hell in a handbasket, what more proof do you need? And I guess we can do a show about the apologist. By the way, you're going to love what I capped the show with tonight. But I guess we can't talk about the defenders of the faith without bringing up Joshua Feuerstein. Oh, boy. You're familiar with Josh, are you? I not? am. I'm familiar with him and his inability to properly film a video <laughs> with a cell phone camera. I've done two videos about him. One directed right. Actually, both of them actually were conversations directed right at him. You know, the first was about the hundred thousand dollar atheist challenge to prove God doesn't exist. And on the heels of offering a hundred K to anybody who can prove God doesn't exist, he then has to go ask for money so that he can have a proper video camera to shoot YouTube videos. And I think, well, your cameras are pretty cheap, pal. How can you offer a hundred grand if you can't even afford your own rig? It's a nonsensical argument anyway. Again, we're not saying God doesn't exist. We're saying show us the evidence before we buy it. We're not going to believe. And he's still shooting on his cell phone and everybody's asking what he did with the $20,000 he raised on. Was it GoFundMe or Kickstarter or something? Yeah. He raised a shit ton of money for a Red One movie camera. And he's still shooting and presenting his stuff on cell phone video. I don't get it. Yeah, he was asking for a red camera, which uh, I, I think you even said in your video, that's just it's overkill for what he wants to do. Um, I actually, in addition to all my YouTube stuff, I, I work with a, an independent, very low budget film company in my local area. And we shoot all of our stuff using Canon EOSs. 
and it looks fine. DSLR camera, you can get a good one now for what? Just a few hundred bucks, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a red camera, if all he wants to do is make YouTube videos, <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. Well, every time he produces and releases a new video is always a big viral response. Everybody's reposting it everywhere for one reason or another. And then you'll see commentary in the media about it. There was an article mid-July in the Huffington Post about his most recent video that he'd put up. I think it was a revisit of something he had actually done a few months ago. He was talking about the attacks on the rights of Christians and how it's time to stand up, even if it means using force. And to draw a circle around this argument, in the last part of the clip, he pulls out an assault rifle. And when he does, his finger is obviously wrapped around the trigger. Now, to anybody who knows anything about firearm safety, this is a huge red flag and an obvious indication this man has had or retained no firearms training whatsoever. He has no idea what he's doing, which makes it even more terrifying. Well, that first incarnation of the clip was deleted from his channel, and he released another one where his finger is not on the trigger, but I guess he was saying pretty much the same thing. Here's a short clip from the first video, which has been mirrored and can still be found on YouTube. Hey liberals, you want to take away my First Amendment right to freedom of speech? Well, guess what? My First Amendment right is protected by my Second Amendment right. So come and get it. Apparently, he's pissed off that the government wants to take the word homosexuality out of the Bible, something along those lines. He's upset about a bakery in Oregon, a couple who own the bakery refusing to bake a wedding cake for a lesbian couple, and their constitutional rights have been violated, blah, 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 blah. Well, if you look at Snopes, the government is not doing anything to change the text of the Bible. The lawsuit that Feuerstein mentioned in the long-form version of his most recent video actually took place in 2008 and was dismissed by the courts. It was a non-issue. It's gone. Feuerstein, in his most recent video, complained that there had been a couple arrested, Donald and Evelyn Knapp, who owned the Hitching Post Wedding Chapel in Idaho. And they were arrested because they refused to perform same-sex weddings. If you look at the facts of the case, they were never actually threatened with arrest or fine, certainly never arrested. And the Knapps registered their business as a religious corporation, making it explicitly exempt from the non-discrimination law in the first place. And even if all these claims are true, and I'm reading now from the Huffington Post, it would hardly lend credibility to the suggestion that Christians should use guns to fight gay marriage. We double-checked and found that thou shalt not kill is still on the list of Ten Commandments. And there's no footnote saying it's okay if you're doing it to fight against gay rights. You can still believe and say whatever you want. You haven't, you haven't lost the right to do anything you had the right to do before. It's just that you, you don't have the right and you never had the right, or at least you never should have had the right to mistreat people or discriminate against people for bogus reasons. That's the only thing that's been lost. And that's something that never should have been there in the first place. And isn't it nice to see yet another example of someone with an incredibly dangerous weapon who is the type of person that you would never want to have one. What's the story on Feuerstein's popularity, Steve? Why this guy? Why are people latching on to him? It grieves me to think that he's enjoying popular. Some people are blaming me for making him even more popular, but I just think after a while... You have to swat the gnat that's buzzing around your face, yeah. don't you? I mean, he's out there. He's popular. People are posting and reposting. I don't know that any of us made him famous, but we are, I think, in a position where we can address the insanity of what he's saying and doing, right? Oh, absolutely. And I do think you have to do that to an extent. If, if the guy's getting five million views on a video, uh, that is incredibly dismaying. But I really don't think that you or any other atheist who has called him out or responded to him has is responsible for that. Uh, I don't know why he has captured the imagination of, of people the way he has. I think I would like to think maybe a good number of those five million are people just tuning in to watch the train wreck. <laughs> uh, they're just watching. Oh, I got to see this. You know, everybody says this guy is crazy. This guy is an idiot. Let me let me see this. Um, but yeah, it, it, he's it's 
it's sort of the recipe for being internet famous. You, you make a spectacle of yourself, you make a big noise, you say something outrageous so that people say, oh, you oh, check this out, you've got to see this. And whether people agree with him or not, uh, he gets attention. And some people who are on his side probably acknowledge that a lot of what he says and does is extremely problematic, but it's the idea of, well, there's no such thing as bad press. You know, he's getting attention for something we believe in, even if we don't necessarily hold to everything he says and does. So we're going to go along with it. I mean, I will give him credit. You know, he knows how to brand himself. The red ball cap is now instantly recognizable. It's been parodied by many others out there who are doing sort of their own response videos. But all of this avoids the question, why would the greatest being in the universe need Joshua Feuerstein to defend him on the Internet? Right. Is this really the big gun in your arsenal of truth, because if it is, it's terrifying. And um, there's really nothing new under the sun when you look at his arguments. He's not giving us anything that's even remotely new. And so when I see people reposting this stuff, usually young people, young males, Mm -hmm. and they were raised in the Christian church and they're high-fiving each other and fist-pumping each other and saying, yeah, yeah, you know, prove God doesn't exist, $100,000, whee! (laughs) You know? <laughs> I, I grieve. I, I'm terrified for the species, you know. I'm going to finish the show tonight with an article that I discovered on a website called GodofEvolution.com. That website ring a bell with you, Steve Shives? I don't think I've heard of it. Okay. I don't know much about it. I mean, I'll admit. But my suspicion is that the author of the website, the creator of the content of the website is an atheist, agnostic, certainly a, a skeptic because of the way the article is written. There's an article called Theory of Evolution Disproven by Video posted on Facebook. It was written by a guy named Tyler Frank, who deserves some kind of a literary award for what I'm about to read you, okay? (laughs) This was originally posted last June, June of, I'm sorry, June of 2014. But I consider it timeless, and so I would like to read the text of that, and I will include the link in the description box of this video. And Steve Shives, you can come along for the ride here. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. It says this, and I quote, The dominant foundational and unifying theory among all biological sciences for the past century, evolution by natural selection, has been thoroughly debunked by a Facebook video every scientist in the world reports. (laughs) The video in question was uploaded May 23rd by social media evangelist Joshua Feuerstein of Fountain Hills, Arizona. According to his Facebook page, Feuerstein is, quote, a 33-year-old bachelor soon to become husband and father to four. From the original posting, the roughly five-minute clip was shared over 188,000 times. Now, remember this article is well over a year old. Quote, evolution is not a science, never has, and never will be. Why? Because it cannot fit within the parameters and parentheses of science for one simple reason. It was never observed, Feuerstein explained in his video. That's why it's not science. That's why it's called the theory of evolution, one man's theory. The fallout in the scientific community has been widespread and devastating. I honestly don't know what to say, a visibly shaken Richard Dawkins told BBC World News this week. (laughs) For decades, the scientist and author has been widely considered one of the world's most eloquent defenders of evolutionary biology, but Feuerstein's arguments left him stammering and virtually speechless. Quote, it's just, I don't know, really I don't. It's like you spend your life studying this stuff, and then one day you see a video on a friend's Facebook page that just undoes everything you thought you knew. Pressed by BBC lead anchor Catty Kay about his thoughts of Feuerstein, Dawkins shook his head slightly, staring off into space with a strangely vacant expression. He's a brilliant man, he said. <laughs> <laughs> He's a brilliant man, he replied softly. A saint. Feuerstein opened the influential video by recounting a recent conversation with an unnamed atheist who'd criticized the social media user for his faith in God. Initially framed as a response to this atheist, the scope of the short clip broadened quickly, as it soon became clear that Feuerstein wished to strike directly at the underpinnings of an overwhelmingly well-evident scientific theory that has for more than a hundred years been used to succinctly and elegantly explain such far-ranging phenomena as comparative DNA sequence analysis, phylogenic reconstruction, endogenous retroviruses, pseudogenes, nested hierarchies, atavisms, 
homologous and vestigial structures, fixed action patterns, continental distribution, island biogeography, ring species, and the fossil record. Without wasting time on such trivial matters, Feuerstein's video skillfully sidestepped the evidence for common ancestry and struck right at the theory of evolution's greatest weakness. It's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> In some accidental cosmic bang, out of that was created one cell, and from that one cell all life springs, Feuerstein said, summarizing the definition of evolution affirmed by all biologists. <laughs> every plant, every animal, every single human being, and somewhere along the way over years and years, we mysteriously and magically all developed different wills and all developed different characteristics and traits because we willed it. I'd never thought about it that way before, admitted Michael Shermer, <laughs> founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine and another once well-known proponent of evolutionary science. Shermer's been in seclusion at his South California home since Feuerstein's video began gaining traction, but he agreed to answer a few questions through email. Quote, Josh just nailed it. That's all there is to it, Shermer wrote in an email that was originally utterly devoid of any capitalization or punctuation, <laughs> although the writer had simply lost the will to follow such mundane <laughs> grammatical conventions. Quote, after watching his video, I remember sitting back in my chair and just thinking, holy expletive. He's right. This expletive expletive <laughs> doesn't make any sense. One of Feuerstein's main points of evidence was what he called the law of thermodynamics, which appears to be a postulate of his own devising, since the scientific canon contains nothing that precisely correlates with the idea. Feuerstein defined the law concisely as chaos can never produce order. Quote, what if I were to tell you that somewhere in Oklahoma, a tornado rolls through a junkyard of old cars and somewhere on the other side of that tornado out of the junk pile, it magically produces a perfectly red, shiny working Lamborghini. You'd tell me I was nuts. You'd tell me I'd lost it. You'd probably try and admit me to the psychiatric ward. Why? Because that is absolutely stupid. I mean, how much faith would it really take to believe something as idiotic as that? And yet that's exactly what science believes, unquote. It's true, we do believe that, agreed a shell-shocked Anne Reed, former executive director of the National Center for Science Education, which permanently disbanded in disgrace last week. Well, at least we did, you know, before Mr. Feuerstein's work was brought to our attention. Appearing deeply humbled, but saying she had to give credit where due, Reed said Feuerstein's scientific contributions to future generations would include not only the law of thermodynamics, but the parable of the Lamborghini in the junkyard, <laughs> but also what the scientific community has termed the stupidity test, meaning that any theory must be ruled invalid if a member of the general public finds it stupid, regardless of what the evidence says. According to his Facebook page, Feuerstein appears to have no formal training in the sciences, but Reed said that is not unprecedented. Quote, Gregor Mendel went into the monastery precisely because he couldn't afford college, and he founded modern genetic science while working in his garden. And look at Michael Faraday. He was a bookbinding apprentice with almost no formal education, and he went on to become one of the most influential scientists and inventors of all time. Reed trailed off, shaking her head and muttering something that sounded like out of the mouths of babes. And after a while, she smiled and shrugged. I guess we're just seeing history repeat itself. Feuerstein's video has not been entirely without its critics. Some, Reed included, have called the evangelist's final thought that the word universe is comprised of uni, meaning one, and verse, meaning a spoken statement. A bit questionable. Though uni does mean one, verse is actually taken from the Latin verter, meaning something rotated, rolled, changed, Reed said. And then she chuckled embarrassedly and looked at the ground. Oh, what's the point, she mumbled, her face reddening. I'm just being a nitpicky, sore, little loser, aren't I? And that's from the God of Evolution.com's <laughs> article by Tyler Frank, titled Theory of Evolution Disproven by Video, posted on Facebook. It's actually funnier, I think, if you read it than if you verbalize it, but I just thought it was worth capping the show with tonight. 
Steve, uh, it's a crazy world out there, but I'm glad you're doing what you do. I'm glad you're out there sort of swinging for the fences and being a part of the conversation, adding some attitude to the facts as you present them. I think it's really good stuff. And I'll make sure and include a link to your YouTube channel in the description box of this broadcast. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Seth. I'm going to keep on keeping on. So Keep on keeping on. And thanks for being a part of our apologetics broadcast tonight, brother. It was an honor and a pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. Thanks so much for listening to the broadcast tonight. And again, thanks to our show sponsor. It's Nature Box. If you haven't tried them, your first box delivered on them directly to your door. So taste the goodness for yourself. Go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. And I'll see you next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com